Okay, um, so welcome everyone to this GE Academy workshop um, on developing gender sensitivity in HCI research. Uh, as a start, Bente will have uh, do an introduction on GE Academy, right? Mm -hmm. So very warm welcome also from uh, the GE Academy team. My name is Bente. I'm one of the partner within the Horizon 2020 funded project GE Academy. And uh, GE Academy, you will see it uh, on the slide, is um, um, Horizon 2020 project with the main aim to develop and implement a high quality capacity building program on gender equality in research and innovation. Um, our trainings are built on state of the art knowledge and expertise. We are very happy to have um, quite uh, good synergies with other Horizon 2020 projects and uh, especially for the trainings dealing with gender in research, we are happy to cooperate with our sister project Chico. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, Sabrina will tell you more about that because she was involved in that project and also the content of uh, this training today is based on her work under the Chico project. We uh, provide uh, tailor-made training materials and we roll out our training and the training materials uh, for different target groups. We uh, address and approach uh, decision makers, human resources, equ gender equality officers at universities as well as in uh, research funding organizations. And uh, originally, I have to um, point out, uh, quite obviously, we started with our project uh, before the coronavirus um, breakout. So we originally intended to develop different formats. On one hand, face-to-face -face trainings uh, and face-to-face -face workshops. We had to, um, well, re-adapt and rearrange these face-to-face uh, -face trainings trainings to uh, online trainings, to online workshops, online webinars. And we are also conducting summer schools. Uh, there will be there were, um, are three summer schools under preparation for this summer. And uh, we are also working on a Duke that is an online uh, training course. And for uh, further trainings and upcoming trainings, please refer to our website. So that was uh, my short introduction and overview on the GE Academy. We have, all uh, right, I should start with an introduction, right? Um, my name is Sabrina Bocha, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a student at TU Wien, Technische Universität Wien, uh, in the Media and Human Centered Computing Master's program. I'm an early career researcher and my master thesis and publications focus on the topic of gender sensitivity in HCI and how to enable people to improve um, their work with regard to this topic. So in the next three hours, here's what we're gonna do. You see the agenda already. Uh, first, we'll have a look at how sex, gender and HCI are connected. Um, followed by a theoretical input uh, based on the literature review I conducted for the sister project GICO that Bente Knoll already uh, mentioned, and the work on a paper that I presented together with my co-author Kata Spiel at mentioned computer conference last year. After that, uh, we'll have a short look at a tool that I designed based on the literature review and the conference paper. Um, and which includes recommendations on how to improve gender sensitivity in human computer interaction research. So uh, what do sex, gender and HCI have to do with each other? And most of you probably know sex and gender are variables that are often used to divide up a target or test population in order to see whether something works equally good for different people. Mostly that is due to the idea that splitting a group of people by gender results in two about equally sized groups of people who, who within those groups are rather homogenous. Um, however, neither sex nor gender can be correctly car categorized in strictly binary ways. And additionally, um, there are other indicators that often work better for usability or tech legibility testing um, as, for example, 
tech affinity, educational background or vocation. And the reason why gender works or rather worked okay-ish when looking at usability is that gender is very often a proxy for things like education or vocation. Um, there's lots of statistics on the gender gap in academic fields, um, but they also apply already at earlier parts of education. For example, in Austria, we have technology focused high schools and they have um, a ratio of 90% boys and only 10% girls attending. So you already have um, this issue that later goes into acad academia. And on the other hand, when looking at sex differences, so bodily differences, um, being specific with regard to the body parts that might be necessary to use uh, a technology is actually the better idea than just assuming that everybody who has a certain gender or sex um, has, has the same experience. So for example, when testing a prototype um, and you want to attach something to the user's bust or chest, uh, not all women have small or big breasts, not all men have no breasts at all, and non-binary people vary as well, of course. Can also relate to hand size if you're working with controllers or if you develop something that is uh, used in a glove. Um, so the GECO literature review, um, funding bodies, uh, increasingly ask uh, applicants to state their projects and or researchers gender dimensions. So for those who have not received training in social sciences or gender studies, these questions are hard to answer. And the idea be behind the uh, GECO literature review uh, was to bridge that gap in between the experts and the interested. And uh, for that, I conducted an in-depth literature review of seven papers published at uh, ACM's um, conference on human-computer interaction. And um, that literature review was actually also made into a video um, as part of the project. So let's watch that one together. So we have a bit of a shared baseline. The link is here. Let's see if that works. Do you see the video now, or do I have to change that? We see the video. Okay. I don't know exactly if it works with uh, the sound, yeah. and yeah. Uh, it's not in a full screen okay. yet. So here's the link so everyone can watch it by themselves um because yeah to keep the to keep the strain on the on everyone's uh, internet connection usable or workable so I'll, I'll ask you to to start the video now and uh after that we can have a short talk about it um are there any immediate questions or any comments on the on the video so far. Okay, thank you. And uh, the question with the video is, um, do you consider the other element of the user, for example, political groups or religions and, you know, cultural diversity apart from gender and age? Uh, yeah, so um, the, the video is just very, very, like, um, compressed and and we had to to take out some of the information so uh, i i do try to um have a more intersectional view that goes beyond age and gender um and education for for my work and uh i think it's also represented in the the paper that i'm going to talk about and also the tool that we're using thank you um so I already talked about the, the, the literature review a bit, and I pointed already towards a paper that I co-authored with Katha Spiel. So the literature review uh, was based on seven papers, and then um, 
uh, we added another three that were published at CHI and at CSCW. On the slide, you can see uh, all the, the papers that we looked at. The ones that I have marked with an asterisk are the ones that we added for the, the, the paper. Um, these publications cover a whole or a large range of um, HCI research and practice, and they showcase different ways of approaching and researching gender. Um, Blackwell et al. looked at the social media usage of parents who are LGBT, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans. Um, Karoi et al. tried to determine the effect of, amongst others, gender on usability of tactile interfaces. Otterbacher researched how gender biases may be introduced into language processing corpora when crowdsourcing uh, the, the text for, for language. Clark et al. worked with women who had left violent relationships on the topic of photography and related technologies. Ahmed et al. used a participatory design approach to develop a platform to report sexual harassment in public spaces. Heimsen et al. looked at how language around sexual health um, of men who have sex with men has developed and how this may be used in different kinds of health-related applications. James DiSalvo et al. developed an extracurricular program for high school students to help them gain confidence in tech-related areas. Keys examine, uh, examined facial recognition technologies and HCI projects building on these technologies and how both approach gender. Metaxa Kakavuli et al. studied how the design of a web interface may have effects on users' sense of belonging, um, which has already been studied in physical space. So they took that from the physical to, uh, to the design of a website. And finally, Fernandez and Birnholz discuss identity disclosure practices of trans folks who use dating platforms, looking at which mechanisms of disclosure platforms provide and how they are used. Um, so from these 10 papers in all, uh, we derived 13 recommendations. And um, basically group them into for uh, in, into the phases of a of a project life cycle and while doing the the work for the for the recommendations uh, so we did a deep dive into the papers and asked ourselves how was gender used or discussed in this research or project what can we learn from this um, and um, as I already said, you will find a link to the literature review, but also to, to the paper uh, at the end in the, uh, in the references. Um, we will look at the 13 recommendations now in more detail um, so that you have um, more concrete ideas of um, how they work. And then we'll have a look at the, at the tool that I developed from that. So we start with uh, the phase of designing research protocols. And when starting to plan a project, uh, we argue that uh, researchers and practitioners should already articulate gender explicitly. So you should make clear early on what you mean when you're talking about gender and how it applies to your research. Keith does that very nicely in their paper um, on automated gender recognition. Uh, when they say too often HCI research has implicitly or explicitly treated gender as a binary, immutable and physiologically discernible concept, concept. such a mo model fundamentally erases transgender people, excluding their concerns, needs and existences from both design and research. The consequence has been a tremendous underrepresentation of transgender people in the literature, recreating discrimination found in the wider world. Um, so here, Keyes explicitly talks about how gender has been used, um, namely binary, immutable, and physiologically discernible concept, um, and uh, states how this uh, impacts trans people. 
then um, while designing research protocols, there should also be space for reflection on um, positionality of the, re of, of the researchers. So what does your own position within our society mean for the work you do? Um, so in Fernandez and Bernholtz, uh, they reflect explicitly, um, they, they work on the topic of, um, um, of disclosure of trans status on the, in dating apps. And uh, so they relay their own um, position to that, their own position to their work by saying the first author who, conduct, who, who conducted all interviews and open coding is a cisgender queer woman. She has had extensive personal experience with trans individuals, including deep involvement with trans activists and social communities. The research team also included a cisgender gay man and a cisgender heterosexual woman. So we see here, for example, all three people who are uh, talked about are are uh, cisgender, so they're, they um, don't have those uh, experiences firsthand of being a trans person using a dating app and uh, making decisions about um, how to disclose your status on that dating app. Of course, uh, such public reflection, because those are quotes from, from the paper, right? Such public reflections of one's own mar marginalization as queer or gay um, can have unintended, even negative consequences. So that has to be considered and shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, the next part when designing research protocols is, uh, of course, we decide which methods to use. And we should think about how these methods might work or might not work for our participants. Um, probing methods for accessibility and sensitivity. For example, Karwai et al, uh, when researching the usability of tactile user interfaces, made sure their participants would all wear the same type of clothing. So that's, um, so that would, so there would not be inter interference there. And uh, on the other hand, Clark et al, uh, who worked with uh, women who had left abusive relationships this, um, and used cultural probes, decided to rename the cultural probes because as they say, the terminology probe was considered unsuitable for the context as it suggested a scientific or medical institutional tone that the women might not appreciate. In line with previous research, we chose instead to position the probes as portraits, emphasizing the process of working with photography as presentations of self to be shared as part of a workshop process. Um, and then finally, in designing research protocols, we need to deliberately ass assess exclusions. It's kind of logical that not everyone can participate in every project. So some participants will be included and other people will be excluded. However, we should deliberate about whom we in and whom we exclude to better see unintended exclusions or limitations. For example, um, Ahmed et al, when working on their platform to report sexual harassment, intentionally approached women from socioeconomically privileged backgrounds because they figure, figured it would be easier for this group to speak about topics associated with stigma, like sexual harassment. Um, as another example, Di Salvo et al. aimed to help high school students from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds to improve their self-image with regards to computer science topics, to help them um, see themselves as, as um, able to become computer scientists or program programmers. Then the next phase is acquiring funding, which has been mentioned by some of you um, trying to, to apply for funding. Uh, here we uh, drew from the, from the corpus that 
it can uh, applying for funding can be used as an opportunity to disseminate progressive ideas. Um, but of course, this is a bit difficult. Um, so for one, you can check the funding body's expectations and find ways to extend them. Because with a good argumentation, projects that attend to issues of social justice more generally may fall under the umbrella of what the funding body expects. So for example, the work of DiSalvo et al, um, I already said it mostly focused, it, it focused on socio-economically socio disadvantaged youth, which in that area where it was located actually um, resulted in work on a young black man in computing. So um, there's new, new areas of research that can be opened up if you go, uh, if, if you look at topics from a more intersectional way. Uh, and second, proposal writing can also be seen as a teaching opportunity because reviewers might not be familiar, familiar for example, with gender as a self-determined identity. So you can, um, so, so, so by explaining things in an accessible way, we can disseminate those ideas and theories further. Um, also, the same applies to intersectionality. So detailing how different dimensions of discrimination combine and intersect with each other and why and where this matters within your project can position your proposal as a best practice. Um, and for example, Otterbacher in their work acknowledges potential biases in the data sets they use. Um, which uh, guides reviewers and readers' understanding of the subject matter. Meta. Um, the third phase is conducting research. Um, and here we can take from Fernandez and Bernholtz and Blackwell et al. to follow participants' choices in identifying them. So asking participants for their pronouns and also actually using them, even if you do not interact with them directly. Um, from Ahmed et al. and again Blackwell, um, we can, um, oh. So in their work, um, that's something that I already pointed out, Blackwell et al., for example, explicitly ask their participants for their preferences on communication, um, but also uh, pronouns and labels. Um, and Ahmed et al offered their participants to choose their interviewer because they talked to university students. The students could actually um, choose to, to not talk to someone from their own university and to have their interview at a different location. And uh, Clark et al. Uh, adapted their project schedule to fit uh, participants' uh, childcare obligations. So they made sure not to have uh, workshop sessions during um, time when school was off uh, so that the participants would not have to, to organize child, uh, uh, child care. Um, then, in order to better explore your plans and limitations and potentials, um, seeking critical fit feedback is very important. Here, uh, we can look back at Clark et al. and how they chose to rename their cultural probes as portraits, uh, which was um, which is an idea that they arrived at after talking to topical experts from the women's center that they worked with. And finally, uh, something that is really difficult um, is actively looking for what is missing, um, which can like finding the gaps in the ideas that you have, which are in the things that you do. So this can be done by gathering feedback from outside the project or um, by starting something like uh, hunting software bugs. So trying to get a feeling for the issues that might get 
overlooked or ignored very often. So in the beginning, you will probably need some guidance to follow, for example, by using appropriate tools. There are some tools that do that. Um, I'll put the link also uh, in the PowerPoint at the end. Uh, so in the beginning, you might need some help or tools or need to read specific publications to get the feeling or develop a sense uh, for, for finding those gaps. And then we're already in the last phase, which is presenting research. Um, so we need to look at how we document and present our work. Um, and here it's uh, one of the points is that it's very uh, important to provide appropriate context information in order for your readers to fully understand your work. So you have to detail and explain the, explain the choices that you uh, made so that others can build upon what you have done. For example, um, you should make clear why you included gender in your research and in what form. If you use pre-collected data, discuss its origin. That's something that uh, Otterbacher, for example, also does. Um, and um, see what the possible incompletenesses are. Um, like Wallet Al, for example, um, only talked to participants in the US and also discuss how their sample has gaps and uh, which way it might skew or not. So basically document all the things that you have discussed and discovered in the stages that I already talked about. Um, then you should also reflect on representation and prior work. So um, representation here also means what are the examples and pictures and imagery that you use? Um, what are the unmarked norms that are reflected in those choices? And um, yeah, what are cultural differences that you might have to, to keep in mind? And finally, this is something where you see that the, that the grouping by faces is something fuzzy. Choose mindful language. That's basically something that you should do all the time. Um, it relates strongly to the other recommendations, for example, regarding pronouns or methods, um, but also includes things like when you refer to abstract individuals or if you are unsure about a person's pronouns, you could use singular they or just the person's name to remind uh, to to uh, refer to them or when talking about gender statistics um, present all options or discuss all discuss all options that were that, that were given to people um, when filling in the form uh, because if you just say 30% um, of our participants were male then there's this huge gap of 70% where readers don't really know uh, if the other options, or if there was only female as another option or if there were more options. So for example, you could say 45% identified as women, 44% identified as men, 7% as non-binary, 4% chose not to disclose the gender. Um, and participants could select or could not select multiple options. And also the, the, the last option, choosing not to disclose your gender is also something that you should um, consider or do. Right, so that's for the theory. So oh, just but, a short information yeah. for you, Sabrina, there is a message in the chat. Oh, thanks for that. I put the chat away. If you have references that can help to yeah. develop a sense for relevant issues from the perspective of gender continuum. Yes, <laughs> I could, I could basically just point you to the references for the for the yeah. paper that Katze and I wrote. Okay. So that was a lot of theoretical stuff relating to papers that you have not read. And um, <laughs> um, 
So bell hooks, any theory that cannot be shared in everyday conversation cannot be used to educate the public. Um, and this is why I created out of those recommendations that I just uh, presented to you, a card deck um, that is intended to be used uh, in groups and uh, to foster and enable discussions. So each card represents one recommendation and includes some questions and explanations as well as definitions of important terms. So, um, and the idea is to yeah, help initiate a discussion within a group of people in order to find or describe gender aspects of a project. Um, the card deck is actually a repeated translation because they the recommendations started out in academic, academic English and then were translated to a more vernacular German because I used the card deck at a summer university last year. And then to enable international dissemination, uh, we went back to English. And um, I tried to stick with uh, non-academic language because I want uh, this card deck to be used also by people who don't have an academic background, either in computer sciences or with, gen with gender studies. And you can find the card deck online. Uh, the website has a short explanation and a link to a draw a random card functionality. For now, I would ask each of you to head to that website and draw a random card. Think about that card and what you have heard so far. Uh, the card deck is available in German and English. I would ask the German speaking attendees to use the English cards so that we use the same set. Uh, so think about the card, what you have heard so far, and then put your questions and ideas in the chat. And we'll get back here in 10 minutes to discuss uh, the input that you have. That's what happens when you draw a card. And the idea is to then read that card and think about how it relates to your own work and um, maybe just, yeah, if you have any questions to that, we'll discuss them in a couple of minutes. There's on my watch says still seven minutes to go. And okay, Robin needs to step out and we'll be back. Um, so you and, and please document your discussions, your ideas and findings in Miro. And afterwards we will look at what everyone has worked on and discuss it in, in the plenary again. So, controls I need, breakout rooms. And I'll make four breakout rooms. So we have three to four participants per room. That sounds good. Um, is the exercise clear so far? Do you have any questions? Basically, we're gonna do what we did before the break, but now in a group so that you can discuss with each other right after reading uh, the cards. Uh, with a bit of luck, you'll have different cards than you had before. <laughs> so we'll be going through the whole Miro and look at what every group has uh, talked about and discussed. So I would ask from each group, one person to give us a quick uh, overview on um, yeah, um, so yeah, the, the thing is, um, because you said the stereotypicality of that last paragraph, 
um, that's the whole point of it because there is this apparent incompatibility of masculinity with emotional health or mental health so that's um, basically that last paragraph is a call to uh, reconsider those those concepts of masculinity that those stereotypes of masculinity that are often very uh, dangerous actually to people who define themselves via those stereotypes and as masculine persons so in, in short um, researchers could address toxic masculinity as in men have to be strong men do not talk about their emotions that kind of thing um, and looking like my idea of, of, of intersectionality here is that if you address issues of mental health, that doesn't have to be only, as we have said before, a women's topic, but it could be just slightly um, adapted so that you can frame it as a mental health issue for, um, I don't know, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged people so that you include men, women and, um, and, and non-binary people and go more on the, on, on the issue of uh, mental health in poor, um, in, in, in financially unstable environments, for example. Who wants to go first? I would like to add something to the first uh, first card because um, when I, when I visited you in the breakout room, we shortly discussed the term of accessibility in this context because uh, on this card the title is check methods for accessibility and sensitivity, and um, accessibility in this case I I, I talk about or I, I understand as, as something very broad and general. So not only a physical accessibility in the sense of disability, but also in the sense of, um, of understanding the technology that is used, having access to the technology that is used um, during your research. Um, and this is also uh, where the renaming of a method comes in that I uh, mentioned in, in the first part of the workshop. Uh, where the researchers, Clark et al, considered that the cultural probe might be, um, might uh, uh, evoke a negative association for the participants. So they renamed it to make it more accessible and uh, to, to make it easier to use for the, for the participants. Okay. You can also see here, this is one of the, this is a recommendation that I did not talk about before because it actually was uh, added on while I was creating the cards. But I realized that it would be something that should be talked about explicitly. So the whole card deck is also something that keeps changing and, and developing a bit. Um, yeah. Budgeting for thing for 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 time, but also expenses um, or room and other uh, things that you might need it's, can be hard if if you try to include people that you have not thought about before, be because you often also don't exactly know what their needs are. So yeah, that's something very good to keep in mind. And then finally. If there are no other uh, comments, we go to group number four. The comments on free stock photos uh, just reminded me that there are actually projects that are working to develop more inclusive sets of stock photos. Um, I'll see if I find uh, a link to that um, or to oh, one of those. Great. Um, because that's, that's especially there's like 
Uh, I think it's a project that comes from the US. So it's mostly, I think, focused on um, being uh, racially diverse. But also, uh, if I remember correctly, there's a, a range of um, like how people present on, uh, on, um, on gender dimensions um, that can be included. That I would like to add uh, is coming back to the card, um, uh, consider and assess, assess exclusions. The point here is also to think about the unintentional exclusions that happen and also the unintentioned uh, consequences of intentional exclusions. So it's all, always a bit of a multi-step process. And it's already five minutes to 12, my goodness. <laughs> so we're going back from the uh, mirror um, to the wrap up. Um, here are, a, um, you can see already that I put a couple of links into the PowerPoint that will be shared with you. And um, I would also ask you to fill in the evaluation questionnaire that um, GE Academy provides. Um, I'm putting the link in the chat. And um, and that's pretty much that. So yeah, please fill in the form, and uh, I'll still be here for I don't know, fifteen to twenty minutes if you still want to discuss anything. And. Else, I hope you had a good time and uh, I hope you all can take something from this workshop.